Hi, and welcome to a very special edition of VidMag. Um, tonight we have Steve Bader of the Lords of the New Church, and conducting the interview, we'll have Danny Reed, ex-bass player from Sil Sylvain and the Teardrops. Hi, this is Stiv TV on VitMag. Tonight you're going to be interviewed and hear interviews by one of the sex symbols and the most well-hung singer in rock and roll, Stiv Bader. But first we're going to bring on somebody who played with one of the legends, the New York Dolls, Sylvain Sylvain. It's Danny, his old bass player from New Orleans. going to be your first guest tonight. My first guest is an old friend about 25 minutes ago. This is going to be my buddy Simon. Can we have a seat? Let's get rid of this. Now, so you have to babysit with all these folks, right? So this is the man we really want to talk to. Now, what is Stiff Bader's really like? The inside story? Stiff Bader's? Well, he's all right, really. You know, so he's got a big, big mouth, basically. You know, but like, we love him, really, you know, even though Despite all his fans, we love Steve, you know, we think he's the older band, the Lords of the Church, we love him, don't we? You're a good liar. So how long have you been in this business, Simon? I've been in this business 12, 14 years. I started out working with Tom Dolbin and the Sex Pistols in 1976. I've been engineer for the Pistols and I've been working ever since then. And here I am now, finished up with the Lords of the New Church here in Cleveland, Ohio, all places. So you started at the top and worked downhill, right? That was the days when everybody spit on each other, right? So, so how you having a good time with these guys? You've been out in the road for what, about a month or so? Seven weeks, and we've had, we've had uh, something of a laugh, yeah. We've had a laugh, it's been all right, you know. And we've been to all sorts of strange places like Vegas, had fun. And uh, this band could be the next Rolling Stones, and they should be. And if we got any support and any help from the people that are supposed to be behind us in this band, this band would really be something. So all you need is like airplay and stuff like that, and the people would come out and see the shows and things like that? Some airplay and some support from our supposed record company and management. And I'm telling you that if those people got behind this band like they should, this band would really be something. I thought, I thought Stiff's father was not somebody else, but not you. So I tell you, we're going to bring Stiff over here now. Uh, we've talked to Simon. And now on... And now on to the big ham of the show. This is Stiff Betas. We have a couple of questions here that I got on my list here. Let's talk about the guitar blues band. You were in 68. I thought only black people played blues. So tell us about the one in 68. One in 68? Yeah. What a conversation list here, I'm telling you. We got a guy who runs at the mouth. All right, so you play blues in 68. Now we got, what are your influences, first of all? Who, who you listen to to begin with? That's right. Okay, now what are your aspirations? What do you want to be 10 years from now? You want to be a doctor, a lawyer, or what? Okay. Okay? Now, Sweating. Am I sweating? Are you kidding? What do you want to do? All right, look, now the we got to... The first question. The first question. Let's, 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 let's get through this list here. Yeah. We already did that. You want to talk about this or you want to sure. go someplace else? Okay, let's talk about the Guitar Blues Band in 1968. How did that lead to what you're doing now? He can't write what shit. Well, I started out in 68 playing blues, and uh, nobody appreciated them. And I went and saw the Stooges yeah. in Detroit, and that's when I realized rock and roll has nothing to do about music. It's just attitude and social change. And how tight your pants are. Exactly. It's like the ruddles, the tight trousers. And how old were you then? Twelve. Twelve. And your pants were tight at twelve? Well, I'm Catholic. <laughs> That's what I want to talk about. You were an altar boy. Yeah. Tell us about the altar boy. Oh, uh, what about them? They were all gay. They bent over for the priest. The priest came drunk on that wine. I was an altar boy, too. Did you used to break into the place and eat all the pruits, the host they give the people at mass? We used to piss on them before and let them dry out and then give them to the people. I'm glad I wasn't in your church. The new church? The new church. We'll get a plug in here now. All right, now let's talk about influences. We know 
that you guys have been around for a long time, and you and the rest of the guys. So who do you listen to, and who do you want to be like? I want to be just like me when I grow up. Uh-huh. And when will that be? I grow up because I'm Peter Pan. But who do I listen to now? Yeah. Dwight Yoakam, Charlie Sexton, Hoodoo Gurus, Birthday Party. Uh, who else paid me? Can I, give, can, I, can I give you some money now? <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, Danny from The Teardrop. <laughs> When's your solo album coming out? My solo album coming out as soon as... As soon as you guys help me do it. All right. Now we're going to talk about... Never. 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 Oh, God. How much you want for it? How much? All right. So now we got to go to the insp uh, aspirations. What do you want to be five years from now? Alive. <laughs> That's too much. Just you for next week. Right? All right. What do you write about? Life. Whose life? Everybody but mine. Get arrested for writing about mine. All right. Now we're going to talk about... What's this about the Russian roulette video? What do you got to say about that? Uh, we did it the first American tour, and weren't allowed to release it because our manager is uh, Miles Copeland, and his father's headed to CIA in the Mideast. Yeah. And uh, we had some footage that we broke in, into the uh, classified department in New York State, and we showed Agent Orange being dropped in Cambodia. So it was a no-go. They uh, censored it. Bye-bye, Simon. Simon's leaving now. Rich Punk from Coke. What is this fascination you have about crawling on top of moving cars and showing your ass to people that are behind you? That's a tough job. Somebody got to do it. <laughs> it's street surfing, a new sport. Street surfing. In fact, I was driving your car in yeah, New Orleans when I did it. Yeah, you got the scratches on it, too. Yeah? Uh-huh. See, it's more of a challenge when you're driving the car yourself and you do it. Yeah, yeah. It started back in Dead Boys Day, 76. Yeah. I picked up this 14-year-old girl and taken her home from work. And uh, we're going down the highway about 70. And I climbed up on top and was surfing. She's asleep, so I was banging on the window. And she looked up. And <laughs> her, her panties were so wet. That's when, you whole, when your whole life was built around wanting to be black from the waist down, right? That's right. And he's accomplished it, folks, most people say. All right, now we're going to talk about, give us your impressions of open your eyes. My what? Your Okay. Well, you open your eyes, fella. That's one of them. <laughs> you dirty rat. Open your eyes. That's another. All right. What other ones? Uh, can you do Jimmy Durante? Is he dead? Now he is. So you well, can I can't him. do him then. <laughs> He's in gay anyway, is he? Uh, he not that I know. know. You nice. tell me. Yeah, really. <laughs> one thing, I keep away from my coke. I can't wait for my coke stash with a smells like that. Is he, was he Jewish? I think, he was, I think he was Irish. Oh, because, you know, with that big nose and airs free, I figure he's Jewish. <laughs> I don't know, but he sure did have a good time in New York. I can do a great impersonation of Buckwheat. I'll tell you. I'll tell you, the man is incredible. He sings, he dances, he changes color before your eyes. So This is color TV? I certainly hope so, or we lost a good effect. So now we're going to talk about Open Your Eyes. Beta's going to tell you the whole story behind the life and times of Open Your Eyes. Well, the song itself uh, probably is the most subversive song I wrote. And we learned from the old days. Subversive or perversive? No, the other songs are perversive. <laughs> uh, in the old days, it was like with Anarchy in the UK and all the other early punk stuff. We used to kick him in the teeth and scream at him and get your ideas across that way. And no one really listens, except your little cult following. And to reach mass media and get the message across, we learned what the government does, subliminal suggestion. What you do is have the chorus very safe, sounding like a love song. And uh, you have all the lyrics hidden in uh, bigger words than most people can understand. So, and it's a catchy tune. So the people are singing the lyrics without really realizing what's going on. And it's all uh, subliminal, subconscious, psychological conditioning. It's actually what the government does with television. And we learned that's the way to get the message across. Just like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds was much more effective than Anarchy in the UK. Supposedly the, the Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds was the initial for LSD and it was a way of like opening everybody's out to drugs in the early 60s. 
Only six and you had Frank Sinatra singing it in Vegas, so. So now I also want to know, what's this feud you got with a reverend out in California? I heard a debate one time, so let's tell me about more about that. I was like picking on a cripple. He's an ex-junkie homosexual. All right. And he knew nothing about the Bible being Catholic. I knew everything about it. You mean Sylvain moved out to California? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got it in for him, huh? <laughs> No, this guy was weird, and, and the more he talked, because he gave up drugs and that, and the more he got into it, he saw his eyes getting pinned. I mean, he's high on Jesus. And, uh, just say he's a real asshole is what he was. Yeah, I've seen people, like, when you go to, like, in the, in the churches, and black churches in the South, they, when they have a testify, they start shaking and sweating and yeah. crawling on the floor and things like that. Then they get, they get, like, the fear of God and Jesus in their hands, and they just, like, have these revelations. But then again, that's what rock and roll is. It's Western civilization, the voodoo. And it's a bit like gospel music. And uh, it's the same thing as on stage. You, uh, you have the singer as a medium. And it's a religion of rhythm. It's moving back and forth. And when it connects the right way, uh, and the people get totally immersed and hypnotized into it, you create a uh, supernatural spiritual entity that can only be repeated at once. So that is the closest anybody gets to spirituality or religion right now. That's the concept behind the new church. Because it's replaced uh, the old church, which became uh, a mind control profiteering organization, which is exactly what it is. It's part of... So, so like pass the basket and put your money in. Yeah, it's power tool. It's like sort of protection selling racket. We can fear everything but death because they don't know what's in life after. And that's how they got us conned. Do you know what's in life after? Sure. Oh, Derek. <laughs> and uh, I, I think, you know, I believe in sex after death. Because everybody gets laid in their coffin, right? Obviously, you don't believe in sex before death. Well, uh, I, I, it's sort of religious, because the last girl I was with was screaming, Oh, Lord, I'm coming. So. And that's where you got the name for the band, right? Sort of. But, you know, at my age, there ain't no second coming of the Lord. Okay. Now, we're going to talk about your, new, your record that came out not too long ago, The Greatest Hits. How many hits are on this one? Uh, no hits. No hits? How many misses are? Let's see, how many misses? What's uh, the number in New York? I, I had a few misses on it. What was her name? Did you ever fuck on a record before? It wouldn't fit in the hole. Well, I used to be with our road crew. You know that one needle dick, the bird fucker? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. All I, all I ever had with my records was people drunk and bumping bottles against each other and throwing their shoes around the studio. But I see LPs as sort of like uh, Buckwheat's cock. It's black, 12 inches long and groovy. What else can you say? That's a pretty good description right there. So now, you guys have been on the road for how long now? Ten years, it feels like. Two months, this one. Last year we did 160 gigs in 170 days across Europe and America. Do, do you find the audience is more responsive in America or in Europe? Uh, it depends on where you're at. It's, it's different in each place. Like, uh, France is crazy. Spain is great. Uh, Berlin is good. Outside of uh, Berlin, it's sort of sort of like touring in Kansas City and that where they're coming to sort of just you know out of uh, curiosity but what's interesting is everywhere in Europe now especially in uh, in Italy you find a lot of uh, street punks Mohicans and uh, they have nothing to lose because the unemployment's so bad there and nobody can get homes so they're all living in the street and it sort of reminds me of uh, what you read about the French Revolution just before it happened all these people hungry in the streets and you have either very rich or the people that are hopeless and it's going to be a revolution real soon unless we have a limited nuclear war and that's what they're aiming for do you find like people look at you more as an international band or an american band or english band uh no i think they uh find us as just uh, a bunch of perverts <laughs> well, to me that was always common knowledge but uh, do, you, do you plan to, to do more time in the States now, or do you plan to kind of base, to still stay in, in, in the London area? Uh, I hope I don't do any time in the States. I did time in Finland. <laughs> in Germany? In two weeks. 
I was thrown in jail there twice. What, 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 do you, what are you fencing for? Uh, arson, first time we burned down a hotel. But it can happen to anyone. It just gets cold. And, and do I smell smoke? Do I still smell smoke? What are you guys doing this now? We're having a party with Hanoi Rocks, and uh, we were drinking moonshine vodka. And uh, I was into the tour. We were in a ski chalet, so we had on a little section. And we were at this uh, one sort of party room. And we ran out of firewood, so the couches went in. And uh, chairs and a TV. A TV doesn't burn well. But it caught this door on fire, which caught the ceiling on fire, which uh, ended up spending about two days in jail. It was right near the Russian border, and they couldn't speak English. So it took us a while to explain that uh, uh, we have money, they will pay and get out of there, but they couldn't understand it. The weirdest thing was they had one interpreter come in. She looked like a typical bull dyke Russian. And she interpreted, and we had to sign uh, our sort of statement in Finnish. Finnish. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it could have been signing anything. So I didn't know, so we thought we were going to be in a nick for a while. And six miles from Russia, and too many places to do it. Really, it seems to me like this, the Scandinavian audiences are really keyed up for this kind of music and things like that. Finland's great. And what, what's strange about Finland is, even now, you have uh, the AM radio playing dolls, sex pistols, damn, they don't play none of the bullshit like Michael Jackson. And, like, we were voted number one band there number one singer over like Stones and all that. And it's like uh, Beatlemania. They're having it for the first time. And it's sort of glam punk. Everybody's sort of cross between the dolls and dead boys sort of look in the Lords. And it's, uh, it's great because you get all these 12 and 14 year old girls. Mm -hmm. And they have nothing to do and it's a police state. So they're drunk on their ass. Martha, don't, Martha, don't listen to this. And uh, in fact, at every gig, next to the dressing room, they have little cells. And you play sports halls, youth clubs, and they grab all the kids and throw them in there. They're too drunk, and they, they're in this cell right next to the dressing room. They let them out the end of the night. They're all falling down drunk everywhere. And uh, they all get stranded, so, you know, you have to bring them back to the hotel room. And that's where your audience comes from, from the cells right next to the dressing room. In fact, they stole Nicky. Our drummer was coming out, and it's like Beatlemania, like I said, where they're screaming, trying to cut your hair, and you got all these 14-year-old girls, about 100 or 200 charge in the hotel. They picked Nicky up and ran away with him, about 10 of them. <laughs> and, how much, and how much did they charge you to take him back? Well, two weeks later, we found him. <laughs> Was his hair the same color? It went totally gray after that. <laughs> the second time we got arrested, it's, uh, they were having a party for us at this uh, disco, and the security guards there, all these old men, and we didn't realize that security guards had the same power as a cop and they wouldn't let us in because they didn't like the way we looked and the party was for us downstairs so I got mad and threw a trash can through the glass windows and six of them come out to beat me up and the president of the French Angels gave me this great belt that had a knife inside a sheath as a buckle yeah. so speak of the there? devil here we go yeah exactly like this so I, pull, so I pulled this on because this six of them I couldn't go through you know my ass be some fucking stupid sin. So, I mean, they're all old men. There goes your finish market. So, uh, oh, the kids hate them, too. <laughs> so, uh, so anyways, uh, we pulled a knife, and they, they backed off. We ran back to the hotel, and I was sleeping with this one girl, and it was about a uh, knock on the door, opening it up, thinking it's one of the, uh, the band. It's about 12 cops in riot gear with uh, helmets and, you know, baseball bats. And they, they knew you were coming. And they hauled me off. You know, you figure in New York you do that all the time. But there, you know, I guess they sort of uh, knew where we were because we sort of looked different for the town. So anyways, I got hauled off and thrown in jail, and I had to do the uh, next two gigs under police custody, handcuffs until I go on stage. I think I heard something about that. So I charmed them anyways, like found out one, one of the cops, they were like uh, my age, and they, uh, you know, 23. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, one was. Do you believe that I got some swamp land in Florida you can buy real cheap? You already sold me that. Did I sell you the bridge? The, 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 no, the one that goes over across the Hudson River. Some guy to do it, Washington. Oh, yeah, right I, I got the contract in the, in the, in the car. Let you see it later on. Okay. Some you big money maker. Take checks, right? Uh huh. Mine's from Goodyear. Good, take them. Yeah, I take okay. them. Yeah, really. You got white fog walls on them? You take Pollocks. 
Pollocks? I don't know. We, we used to quarter for Pollocks this year? Anyway, all seriousness aside, uh, uh, one was a big Jack Bruce fan, so right away the band's like, uh, oh, your eyes look just like Jack Bruce. I used to record with him, and this guy's all chuffed, and the other guy's a Stones fan. These your eyes look just like Johnny Thunder. And we were telling him uh, how, you know, hang out with Keith Richard and that. He's a friend, and so he was all chuffed, and we started uh, getting him drunk. And I was acting totally teetotaler, you know, it's like uh, not drinking. And uh, by the end of the second gig, they're fucking drunk on their ass, going at the discos with the girls, letting me have my own room, because it's supposed to be chained to a radiator. And they just, they let me pull a girl up to the room, and, you know, just didn't give a shit, they trusted me. Anyways, I got out of it, because I had this chrome lighter in my shirt pocket. And when we first started uh, leaving for the airport, I uh, sort of like had him watching from side of her eyes and pulled out the chrome lighter real quick so the sun would reflect. And they jumped for grab for their guns right away. And uh, I thought, oh, you think they thought this was a knife? Because it was at nighttime. And then they started believing the story of that. So uh, in the end, they intimidated the guy to press charges against me to uh, drop the charges or, you know, they're going to bust him because they had some things on him. So. It, we, we made headlines three days in a row. And finally it says, knife turns out to be chrome cigarette lighter. <laughs> so if this ever goes to Finland, you gullible, stupid motherfuckers. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Growing up in the, the middle of America, where it's conservative and, and everything is, is sort of... I never grew up. You never grew up? Okay, well, let's say living okay. in, in the middle of America as a child, and still are a child. Yeah. A Catholic altar boy... Being from a conservative background, does that tend to make you more rambunctious or wild or drive you more? Well, nuns are a lot like Nazis. <laughs> I mean, uh, like for talking in class, they get those old T-square rollers, sharp points, mm -hmm. and you have to kneel on them and hold a chalk between your nose and the blackboard, and if it falls, they get out the yardstick and start, you know, beating you. Yep. And uh, I see uh I try to be as bad as possible all the time because I loved it. The same way when I was, I grew up in Catholic schools too, and uh, we used to have priests that would come along and have rubber bands tied around their fingers, and they'd walk up to the girls with the short little Catholic dresses on and pop them right behind the, behind the back of the legs on their asses. It was, yeah. a, it was a lot of fun. We used to come out to recess real early to watch that. I went to a place called Ursuline High School, <laughs> and uh, we had this one guy, Father uh, Sebastian or Sabatino, yeah, and he got... Sabotage. He got thrown out because they, they had a little gay mafia there. Him, Father Fry, Father Succo, there's about four priests, and they're all flaming homos. They used to do the thing like have you in detention, put your arms around you if you talk to you and say, so what are you going to do when you grow up? And hands are going down and grabbing the ass. He, they finally got busted because the uh, principal bought the head uh, quarterback, the star quarterback, the brand new vet. You know, always used to have him in detention for, you know, private talks. Have you ever seen the movie Onion Field? No. About the two guys that uh, they kill the cops in Onion Field in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah, well, supposedly, yeah. like the the white guy was 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 uh, molested when he was real young by a priest, and he said that he had fears of like being in like deserts and things like that ever since he was a kid, and that's what drove him to kill the cop in the Onion Field, was that he was molested by a priest when he was real young. Yeah. Yeah, it's, real, it's a good book. You should read it. I want to I want to talk the about the only way you come out of that is either a total rebel or a wimp. You end up being dominated giving all your money to the church and your wife, and that's what they preach, guilt. Very tough. He's a rebel from the neck up and a wimp from the neck down. It's very easy being schizophrenic, sir. Also makes a nice... Hey, but... And you're never alone. But do you believe in God? Sure. Do you believe in a God? Yeah. You're looking Where? at him. Where? I'm God. You're Lord? Lord and God. All right. What I want to talk about is the early days. When, um, when the Dead Boys were here and they moved to New York and you were playing for Hilly and Seabees, tell me about that kind of story. Hilly and Seabees? Uh, I had more sex than the girls lived there. That's the toilet. Uh, it, was, it was total insanity, but it's like a magic that can never be repeated. The Ramones, Talking Heads, Talking Heads, Blondie, uh, who else is around then? The dictators. Yeah. Uh, all of us lived in the Heartbreakers, the Thunders. All of us lived within a five-block radius, and nobody was big then. We all used to play the club, and no one 
come down with the other bands and their girlfriends. And uh, back then it was so poor, we'd have to live off hookers or strippers. Hey. That was the only place to live. Is there a Jesus or are you just a Jesus? No, Jesus is uh, my Coke dealer, Jesus Rodriguez. Really? Yeah. Puerto Rican from Jesus, not Jesus. 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 <laughs> so anyways, uh, it was a lot of fun then. And uh, slowly degenerated when all the uh, tunnel and bridge kids come over. And it got popular. Jersey, yeah, right. But uh, the best way to describe it was uh, Jeff Magnum, our bass player, wouldn't join us for a while, so we played a year without a bass player. When we started getting popular, Jeff decided to move to New York. And he's expecting this big flash place, CBGB's. We were loaded, thinking we lived in his penthouse. Chelsea. Because we were telling him all this. Yeah. And, uh, we uh, brought him up, and he saw CBGs with dog shit everywhere. <laughs> and, and right above us, a uh, wino crash pad. Yeah. And we'd be practicing in the afternoon, they'd be throwing bottles down on us, we waking him up. And he's right on the Bowery, and he's starting to really get manic. We take him back to the hotel, our, our flat on East 9th between 1st and 8th. We're the only white family living there with all Puerto Ricans. And uh, he wouldn't go out for two days because he kept hearing gunshots and people screaming. And he finally gets some sleep and wakes up because there's just mattresses everywhere. There's three rooms and nine guys living there. And he wakes up and he sees these two girls, Susie Headbanger from Ramon Song. Mm -hmm. Her and Kathy Curls. Isn't that uh, Didi's ex-wife? No. Maybe ex-girlfriend. <laughs> but uh, he wakes up and it's about six in the morning, sunlight's coming in. And he's watching these two girls eat each other out and Zero's dressed in his uh, Von Zero outfit. <laughs> his director and he's whipping them with... Uh, with a riding crop. And Jeff opens up, looks at that, and says, Jesus Christ, I'm in hell. And that was it. That's the best way to describe it. Hey. Life in hell. I think they should experience it. I think they should experience Catholicism because it really warps you. Do you miss those days? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's sort of like missing hemorrhoids, you know? Only when you sit down. No, it was a great time, but, you know, it can't be repeated, and it's best for the memories. You, know? you feel like you've progressed, or have you regressed? Uh, you know, it went in both ways. Musically progressed, in a sense, because Dead Boys went as far as they could. Lords are better musicians, in a sense, more eclectic. And my writing's better since I went to London because here I had 24-hour inf interference all the time, invasion of my brain, because TV, you know, get in the clubs free, a lot of drugs, a lot of uh, everything. In England, everything shuts at 11, the pubs, and drugs are scarce, and uh, the English bitches are weird. <laughs> Tell me about So I, I found myself reading books and writing uh, lyrics and work on my music. So and you... It's good. When is the next record coming out? Uh, shit. We got Killer Lords out now, the compilation, which was uh, finished about uh, oh, a year ago, March. We're doing some demos right now. We're recording a soundtrack for a film called Thrashing. It's been wild in the streets, Garland Jeffries also. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah. Yeah. And after that, uh, we do these demos. Uh, then we recorded the album in, in uh, Paris. And I'm also working on a solo album for a bump record and do a bunch of 60s cover songs. And, yeah, and I'm producing... You gotta watch band. out, Bomb has a tendency to owe people money. I got it for 60 grand. <laughs> Hope it's up front. Oh, yeah. And, uh, uh, there's a band called Angels in Vain. Remember them? From yeah. New York? Mm -hmm. I'm producing their, uh, demos out in L.A. when I get that. So you're gonna be in the States for a while and go back to London, or are you gonna be kind of base in the States for now? Uh, I could, I could bass in L.A. because, uh, the coke's better there. Are you going to steal basses? If I've ever based, only steal, I've only stolen basses, never based that one. Yeah, I did once. It's weird. Stole the bass? No. I had to pay for it. <laughs> this troubled bass in this guy I knew, uh, his neighbor walked up, he's been up for about a week, come over with blood all over him, and says, something's wrong with my family. The guy just chainsawed him. All those kids, uh, you know, it's weird stuff, that's why I don't really do it. Wasn't there a movie about that once? Uh, what? Twice? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't watch movies. 
Okay, so now you, you're working on a whole lot of projects here and there. What, what do you do in your spare time? Sleep. Especially with all the touring. But when I got a lot of spare time, uh, one of my favorite hobbies is I got this old raincoat. It's got bags of candy in it and I like to hang it out of schoolyards. <laughs> hang on the Port Authority. Yeah. <laughs> That's fun. And torture. Studying. Human, human torture? Yeah, you know, go to a lot of best and m parlors. You mean like, when you, when you were a kid, would you just take little frogs and lizards and like crucify them and burn them at the stake? I know we did it down south. I mean, it was a leftover from the KKK, but I don't know, maybe you did it up north. That's sick. No, we used to do that to babies. It's a lot more fun. You know I put a baby feet first in a blender? So you can watch the expression on its face. Right. It's worse than the Ethiopian jokes. Tell us an Ethiopian joke. Uh, what do you call an Ethiopian with shit hanging out of his ass? What? A poser. Okay, so where's your next stop on the tour? Chicago. And that's tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, yeah. It's gonna be a long drive. It's a it's a rough trip on the road this time. You've been out for quite a while, and and it just gets harder every time you go. To... Yeah. <laughs> Still, we'll go down in history as being the uh, the man who gave Iggy the peanut butter at the Cincinnati Rock Festival. And uh, being a next door neighbor to uh, Sid Vicious and Nancy, and being the man who gave him the knife, why don't you elaborate a little bit more on that? Uh, well, with the peanut butter, uh, I, I, was, I was about 13 back in uh, 69 or 70, the uh, rock festival, and Iggy dived on top of us. And I've been trying to explain to people what Iggy and the Stooges were like, because uh, they've only played Detroit, and it's his first time outside the city. And somebody had a picnic basket, and that's just, uh, well, if he smeared that peanut, or gave him a peanut butter, he smeared it on himself, and then back then, like, no one did that. They're going, nah. So anyways, they come out, and they got swastikas draped over their amps, and he's just wearing nothing but uh, silver lame pants and these black gloves, and he's diving on the audience, and the best part of it is some kid was on acid up on the sound tower, and he talked the kid into diving off into the audience, and I think he died. But, uh... Iggy dove on our shoulders, and we were holding him up, and this kid taps me on his shoulder, and he had the peanut butter. So I handed it to Iggy. He looked down and smeared it on himself. And that's when I decided to be a singer. It's sort of, uh, you know those things in Marvel Comics, sort of when the kid becomes a superhero, he's just some ordinary kid, and all of a sudden something wham happens, and uh, it changes his life. Well, when I looked at Iggy, and when he looked at my eyes about the peanut butter, it's like hard to describe in like the a transference of power yeah it sounds sort of like real hokey and, but it was very very cartoonish and, and it was like sort of an enlightenment or a passing of something like the father to the sun it, it, it's the eyes and it seemed like all time stopped there was no sound just a contact with the eyes and it seemed like an eternity but a split second and it seemed a light came from above or it, or just some type of power and it went from his eyes into mine and after that it just suddenly totally changed everything inside me and I wanted to sing and it's in a way I think it transported part of his soul and put it inside me or the demon that he was being driven by came inside me which you can do with transference with the eyes because uh, that's uh, sort of the key to all uh, transcendental soul sound like a hippie was that link yeah and uh the same thing happened with mike monroe from hanoi rocks he was uh 19 and tripping in uh scandinavia in stockholm and he had no idea to be a singer at that time and he went into a record store and saw my solo album and he looked at the eyes on my solo album and it, he felt the same thing and uh we had never really, I never told him about that. He told me about how it affected him. So I told him about Iggy, and Iggy remembered it. So it's, in a way, it's like, and Iggy got that from Jim Morrison the first time he went to the whiskey. Uh, Jim Morrison's on stage, and Morrison looked directly at him, and he felt the same thing happen. So I guess there is this sort of communication or transference of this attitude or this fire or these demons.
Yeah, well, it looks like you can you can spring up, you can unleash the thing that's there somewhere in the line by the, by the contact between the eyes. Yeah, and if you have sort of your mind's an antenna or receptive, the way I feel is music that was written in the past and in the future is all in the air right now, and it's like uh, Lennon and McCartney together produced this sort of antenna that picked up on it. They received it. They didn't write the songs. They were given the songs, and the songs came through their bodies and they transferred it to, uh, into form because all rock and roll is sort of a human sculpture of uh, energy. And Uh, it was, uh, when that happened with Iggy, I started to become, uh, I just wanted to be a singer. First time I got up the song was, uh, it was Mick Jagger's birthday, in fact, and, uh, it was in Canfield, Ohio. And I, uh, uh, conned this guy let me in the concert free, saying, oh yeah, I can imitate Iggy on stage. And then I hid from the rest of the day, because I'd never sung before. And they got me, and I got real drunk, and I was with Frank from Blue Ash. That was the band. And uh, we did I Want to Be Your Dog, and I dove off stage and with the mic stand, and it caught in, in the uh, ground, split my head open, and all this blood started coming out. So I put my head inside the bass drums and made a swastika with the blood, and uh, the drummer, Blue Ash, threw up. So Myron Grunbach, you know, Pat Benatar now, he jumped on the drums, and I just went total mayhem, like Frank dove in the audience, snapped the neck off his bass, and I climbed the uh, tarp was throwing blood on people and dove on this one girl and got whipped cream, smeared blood and whipped cream on her teeth, threw up, and got taken away in an ambulance. That's when I knew that was my career. All of this could have been for naught if you would have gone to a Helen Reddy concert instead of an Iggy show. True. I could have been wearing dresses now and boring the shit out of everybody. What but Johansson uh, was doing that. <laughs> Another dig. <laughs> So, and anyways, it, it just progressed from there. Uh, Dead Boys, at the time, were the first American punk band in the sense that Ramones had the sound but not the style. And uh, when we cut our hair short, which we thought was going to be something totally unique, Sex Pistols come along, but we're the first American band to have the effect and the look of what later became punk. And uh, so from there, we became sort of the darlings of the media, so that's when the Stones and that started inviting us around because they're intimidated by the new punk. They start to feel like old men. You know, it always seemed to me at that time like there was three bands, like it was the Dead Boys and Aerosmith and the Dolls. The Dolls sold, sold clothes, Aerosmith sold records, and you guys sold bandages. True. I got uh, taken to the hospital seven times in a row from the gigs and CBGBs. Split my head open and come back, suck and set bandage up. Our, uh, well, I still got some, uh, this is from the Dead Boys. This yeah. razor slash, yeah. It was our first uh, anniversary, and some girl slashing the razor. It's a present. It's like a lot different thing. Everybody's into violence and, uh, and blood. The front row used to get razors and slash their arms, and you'd autograph people's arms with razors. It's a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. And, uh, anyways, getting back to the point, uh, Tell us about uh, being yeah. next door to uh, neighbors to Sid and Nancy. Uh, I'd read in Cream magazine that the uh, Sex Pistols uh, uh, hated us. They asked Sid, "Is there anybody you'd like to kill?" And he says, "Yes, to pay because what he said about Johnny Rotten." And I uh, only told the truth that he's faggot. And uh, so Sid threatened to kill me. And I heard he was in New York. And I, we were playing CBGBs that night. And I told. Uh, or one roadie, if uh, Sid jumps on stage to fight me, don't beat him up or throw him off, because then, you know, he could always say, ah, oh, Sid pussy out, you know, and his minders get me. And uh, the roadie says, well, what's Sid look like? Because the roadie is real intelligent. And I says, well, he sort of looks like, and I'm describing him, and I says, it sort of looks like this guy coming down the street, and here's Sid and Nancy walking into Chelsea, and I says, hang out, because Sid's big, you know. Yeah. And uh, I turned around and said, good morning, Sidney. And they went, 
You still? Yeah. Why don't you come up to our hotel room? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, all right. Start walking, and Nancy goes first. And Sid says, go ahead. I said, no, you go first. Because he's real notorious for chaining people from the back. He says, no, you first. He says, is it true you like to fight? Or, yeah. And I says, yeah, is it true you're still after me? He said, no, you can't put his arm around me. And we became best of friends. Yeah. Uh, he was living on the first floor, and he fell asleep and burnt the room down. So they moved him up to the 12th floor, right next to me. And we became real good friends. For three months, he'd been asking me to buy him this knife that D. Ramon gave me. Sort of like the best street knife, this 007s. Yeah. Fuck knife mm -hmm. that you carry in the back. So I took Sid and uh, Nancy up uh, that afternoon to get some knives in Times Square. They each bought one. And uh, the difference between the two is they have leather thongs in it. I took Sid's out and showed him how to carry it. Nancy kept hers in. And uh, we went back to the hotel. And that night we had a fly to play Cleveland. And I guess what was happening was uh, Sid was on the methadone program. Him and Nancy go get their fix, buy some heroin, shoot up two and alls, uh, quail, eat quaaludes, and they'd uh, be perfectly normal. So they had a very bad habit. And that night, I guess they need two and alls. And there was uh, a guy named Rockets Red Glare that set him up at four in the morning to buy two and alls off this dealer in Brooklyn called Steve. And they offered forty dollars a tune off if he'd come in because it was so late. So Steve came in. Now the rest is speculation on my part because I did it very much undercover. After the murder, I wasn't able to get a hold of Sid because Malcolm McLaren turned into the circus, and then he died before I ever got to talk to him. Now what happened was Sid shot up the tune off, passed out right away. Now Nancy either didn't want to pay the guy the forty dollars or whatever, but she pulled a knife on him, I speculate. And the guy either fought with her, and she fell on the knife and died, or he stabbed her. And he took all the money, because he used to keep rolls of hundreds, and split to California. And uh, Sid woke up in the morning, and couldn't see Nancy, so he went out and got something to eat. Came back, found her in the bathroom, dead, and went in a state of shock, called the police. They came in and arrested him, and if you ever see, when they're taking him out, he's smiling because it was sort of gallows laughter. He just totally fried. And uh, she was his whole life. He went and killed her because she was everything to him. Mother, girlfriend, manager. So uh, so anyways, he's in jail. He gets out. He's thrown back in for slicing up Patty Smith's brother. And uh, finally, in the case, they found on Nancy's knife, there was two different blood types, and one didn't match Sid's. So they let him go that night also, her knife had the throng in it. If Sid was going to kill her, he'd do it with his own knife. Yeah, right. Out of pride. So, oh, see, see you later. Good you think? No. Take care. Okay. I'll do that. Thanks. Bye-bye. What do you think? Oh, well, you take the throngs out, because when you wear it in your back, you yeah. can see the throng, so yeah. it concealed it. So, so uh, Sid didn't have any. So, uh, anyways, the throng was in the knife, so it was obviously Nancy's. And so when the cops let him go, uh, all he had to do was show up the next morning and do a blood test, and he wouldn't have been the prime suspect. Now, this tune dealer found out about this, and there was a party for Sid that night, Michelle Robinson, she was living with her, Sid and his mother. And Sid, the mother, had been neglecting him all his life. She used to, she was a junkie, and she had all these uh, hippies stayed, and they used to beat up Sid and that. I hated hippies. And, uh, well, I even got the name Vicious because mm. he wasn't. Yeah, he was right. a teddy bear guy. Yeah. He's a real nice guy. So, uh, anyways, uh, this friend of the tune all dealers came down and gave Sid some smack. And Sid hadn't, like, banged up the whole time when he was in jail. So he was, uh, his resistance was really low. And the guy told him it was weak. So it gave Sid a lot. Michelle noticed the guy was just doing a little bit when he banged up and he's a heavy junkie. So she ran in to find Sid, and he was OD'd. So they packed him in the ice, threw that guy out, and he came too. And he went to bed. Now, she was his mother was supposed to wake him up at quarter to ten to uh, go down for blood tests at eleven. And she fell asleep, never woke him up, and at exactly ten thirty-five, he died. Now, if his mother woke him up, he would have lived because 
he just sort of, I guess he ate it too, and I went to sleep, and it just reacted everything. And once he was dead, case closed. They didn't care anymore. Do you think it was neglect on his mom's part? Or? Sure, all his life, that's what drove him to it. And, uh, and then Danny killed him. But Sid never killed Nancy, and there's a film coming out exploiting the fact that he did. So it's about time to the story was told right so there's, away. There's still a story to be told after all these years. Yeah. And I even talked to uh, one guy that was setting up the film to tell him the truth so they can do it and present it the right way. But they didn't want it because he said it wouldn't sell. People want it to be the murderer, and they want sensationalism. So they want flash and trash and no truth. But that's how it's going to go down. Sid killed Nancy. They never did. Anything else you'd like to say? Yeah. Do you believe in uh, premarital sex? Depends on who I'm being premarital with. What are you doing later? Martha, I didn't do it. Say hi to Martha. Hi, Martha. He's being a good boy. Looks like that's it. This concludes Stiv TV. I'd like to thank Danny Reed and Simon Phillips as guests. And this is Stiv Bader from the Lords of New Church watching you, watching me on VidMag. Viacom, channel 27. Back, kiddies.